Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you may be. And thank you very much for joining us at this T20 Roundtable on Digital Technologies Building Global Trust, which is part of the Italian presidency under the Think20 or the T20. This event is co-hosted by the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG, and the Italian Institute for International Political Studies, or ISPI, the T20 National Coordinator and Chair, in cooperation with the GovLab at New York University and Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, or CAS. My name is Bob Fay, and I am the Managing Director of Digital Economy at CG, and I'm also a co-chair of the Digital Transformation Task Force in the T20. Today, we are going to discuss how to build global trust around digital technologies. And we have assembled an amazing set of speakers to discuss this topic, who will bring a wide variety of views. Trust is related to inclusiveness and whether people are benefiting from advances in technology or being left behind, the digital divide. It is related to governance, the rules and regulation over the uses of technology and importantly, the data that are gathered via the use of digital technologies, and of course, control over how the data are then used in these technologies, such as those related to artificial intelligence. And given the global reach and interconnected nature of digital technologies, trust is related to the inclusiveness of who is included in the creation, implementation, and enforcement of government's governance frameworks. And I, Unfortunately, I think it's fair to say there are wide gaps in each of these areas. So before we begin the discussion, some housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and will be posted on cgonline.org in the coming days. In terms of how this meeting is set up, we will have two rounds of questions. In the first round, each speaker will be given five minutes to give their definition of digital trust and its essential elements. Once that round is done, we will turn to our second question what is the way forward to build global digital trust? And each speaker will then have three minutes. We'll then have a brief discussion before ending this event. There will not be a public Q&A. So full speaker bios can be found on the event page at cgonline.org. So I'm only going to give a very brief introduction to the speakers. So the, uh, in terms of uh, the order in which they will speak, uh, beginning with Maria Chiara Carozza, who is the lead co-chair of the T20 Task Force on Digital Transformation. And she's also the president of the Italian National Research Council and the former Italian Minister of Education, University and Research. We also have Andy Wyckoff. Uh, I think we have Andy. We were having some technical issues, but um, I'll introduce him and hopefully he can come in. Uh, Andy Wyckoff is Director of Science, Technology and Industry at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We also have Erica Borghardt, who is Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment in the United States and one of the co-chairs of the T20 Task Force on Digital Transformation. We're also pleased to have Heidi Twarek, an Associate Professor jointly appointed at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia and a CG Senior Fellow. We also have Nicole Turner-Lee, who's a Senior Fellow in Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institute. And finally, Stefan Verhust, who is Co-Founder and Chief Research Officer at GovLab at New York University. So it's now time to begin the panel. And um, I'm gonna begin with Maria Chiara. Thank you for being here. And as lead co-chair uh, of the Digital Transformation Task Force, I think it's appropriate that you begin the discussions. So let's start with how you would define digital trust and its essential elements. Okay, thank you very much and good morning and uh, uh, good, good afternoon. afternoon. And uh, okay, my I think that uh, digital trust is uh, for me, I am a researcher uh, is um, is something uh, which is related to a research area because uh, now digital trust is not accomplished. So we have to work and to develop some research in this area to, to give some answers to some uh, issues that must be uh, a guideline for uh, research and development. 
First of all, uh, if we look at what is uh, digital tra uh, trust from the research point of view, we have to provide safety, uh, security, privacy, reliability, and an eth an eth and the ethics. So uh, something which is uh, uh, regulated by ethics. Ethics is important uh, for uh, ensuring that there is uh, an, an inclusive approach to digital uh, trust. Then we have also to provide affordability uh, for people to access and to be able to use uh, uh, digital uh, tools. And then we have to provide education and training in order to, um, to reach uh, digital trust, because trust is something which is related also to, to culture and to education, to the ability to understand what we are doing uh, wh while we are using digital tools. So we have to work on all these issues, and uh, for what concern uh, uh, interdisciplinary approach, we have to um, develop research from the public and private law point of view in order to provide uh, uh, an approach to regulate uh, digital trust from engineering point of view in order to uh, provide uh, um, security and safety for people to work and from political science and also from uh, a social science point of view, we have to work in order to provide sustainable um, uh, access to uh, digital trust and also economic uh, sustainability for uh, uh, building this scheme for digital trust. So it's something which is moving and uh, also very, very new uh, in a sense, because now it's time to uh, make some statements and work at the international level towards the uh, discussion on uh, digital trust and how we can provide a safe and regulated flow of data. Yeah, you certainly laid out a lot of challenges and uh, a lot of work that uh, that is required and, um, and the multidisciplinary approach, clearly essential. So I think, uh, now we're going to turn to uh, to Erica. So Erica, can you go next, please? Sure, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, so my uh, my research focuses on the cybersecurity of the global financial system, which is part of my work at the Carnegie Endowment's FinCyber Initiative. So um, my answer to this excellent and difficult question is sort of oriented around that particular lens. Um, and I think we don't, we don't always associate or sort of inherently naturally associate digital trust and the challenges of digital trust with, um, you know, cybersecurity of the international financial system. But um, I, I think it's I think it's particularly important in this realm. And it's also really uh, challenging to establish because there's so many different stakeholders that are involved with a variety of different interests, which may sometimes be in tension or even in conflict with one another. Um, and so I, I think that digital trust is an essential issue for thinking about the cybersecurity of the global financial system. So I, I thought I could perhaps briefly speak to a few different uh, ways in which that manifests and why they're important. Um, First, at a sort of basic level, um, financial infrastructures and institutions are built inherently on consumer trust. And if trust in these infrastructures is eroded, there will almost inevitably be systemic consequences. And for financial services, this isn't only or even primarily a cyber issue, but we do see in the context of cyberspace that a cyber incident that erodes consumer trust in the system could have cascading effects on financial stability overall. And so in this sense, cultivating a resilient global financial system is inherently linked to this concept of trust. Um, and I would say this isn't a hypothetical issue. Um, because uh, you know, uh, assessments coming from industry and from government sources all sort of converge on, on the consensus that a major cyber incident that poses a threat to financial stability is not a question of if, but, but of when. Um, and, and so second, you know, at a more, drilling down to a more specific level, um, the issue of trust in the integrity of financial data and algorithms is particularly important. Um, so it, as distinct from cyber incidents that may affect the availability of data or the confidentiality of data, 
there really are very few um, technical solutions that can address the risks that come from the manipulation of data integrity. Uh, we're seeing this recently um, or, or, or now with, with the uh, threat of, of ransomware, which has gotten so much public attention uh, due to a number of concerning incidents. And this gets at the heart of trust and the integrity of data. Um, I would also point out that um, this particular issue of trust in the integrity of data is very important in the context of financial market infrastructures like clearing houses and payment systems, which sort of comprise the backbone that enables the broader system to function. And so of concern uh, of concern to me in, in my research is, um, is cyber attacks that may call into question the integrity of um, an exchange's transactions or data, which could undermine trust in the overall system. And then finally, um, you know, briefly, I think that um, even the solution to making the system more resilient requires overcoming trust-based barriers. Um, you know, I my sort of research focuses on how to improve collaboration between the different stakeholders that are involved in the cybersecurity of the global financial system. Uh, they're diverse; they have different and sometimes competing interests, and um, and so the challenge is that to get at better collaboration, these different stakeholders across governments, um, uh, industry, technology companies, um, uh, regulatory and supervisory communities, um, is that these stakeholders have to trust one another to make it work. Uh, firms have to be willing to share private information with one another despite concerns about unfair advantages. Industry and government have to be willing to share sensitive information with one another to improve the overall resilience of the system. Um, so overcoming these trust barriers is essential for resilience so that industry and government can, can have a more complete understanding of the nature of the threat environment and improve their readiness to respond to cyber incidents. So just in summary, um, if you look through the narrow lens of the cyber resilience of the global financial system, I think there are a number of different ways that trust-based challenges manifest in this space, which can be barriers to cooperation and potentially pose systemic risks. So thank you. Great, thank you, Erica. And you know, I think in in many respects, the financial sector. I mean, we can learn a lot about um, governance around data and technologies uh, by what's going on in the financial sector. And of course, the financial sector is also a very good example of what happens when we lose trust. And we saw that in the great financial crisis. So, um, let's now turn to Heidi. I think you're up next. Heidi Torek, please. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you to the previous two speakers who set me up perfectly to talk about my definition of digital trust. So Maria Chiara talked about the importance of interdisciplinarity, and I couldn't agree more, and I throw even more disciplines into the mix. You know, one is obviously the, the long sociology of trust, um, and the other is history. Of course, we're, we're not dealing with the question of whether people trust in a new technology uh, for the first time. So I would say there's, there's some lessons we can learn from from history as well, and that kind of interdisciplinarity is, is really key in trying to solve what some might say is a wicked problem. How do we create trust in a, in a very varied digital landscape? Um, so one way to sort of break this down, I think, is to think about the, the different elements of the, the platforms that we're actually talking about here. So there's the, the content questions, um, there are data questions, um, which Erica already talked about a little bit, um, there are competition questions, do people feel that this is a fair environment? And then of course there's physical infrastructure questions as well. So I think one of the, the ways in which my work on platform governance is, is trying to break this down is to really show there are these multiple different uh, categories of how we can think about trust, whether someone trusts in uh, data and whether their data is being securely handled could be quite different as to whether they uh, trust that the things that they're posting on social media are being um, arbitrarily or otherwise deleted and so on and so forth. So I think that's one way of thinking about this is to try and break it down a little bit more because it's such a large question. Another, I think, really important way to think about this is to recognize that, that any discussion about um, building trust has to be one that's multi-stakeholder that goes beyond just questions of, of states and companies, also to include um, civil society. And Bob mentioned at the beginning the question of inclusion. And one other way of thinking about that is the question of the role of civil society in doing things like writing the rules of the digital space. So the question of who gets to write the rules is, I think, a really crucial one if we think about why different groups of people should trust in a digital environment. Part of that is a question of whether they feel that they have had a stake in creating those rules and whether they feel that those rules are 
arbitrary, both in their creation, but also in their enforcement, which we've seen as, as one of the crucial problems in content moderation, has been a feeling from various groups of people that even though there are terms of service from social media companies, that they're often being arbitrarily enforced depending upon who you are or where you are located. So then one other final element of, of trust that I'll throw onto the table is the question of uh, transparency that could really enable people who are using these types of platforms to understand what is going on. So that even if something is not in fact arbitrary, they have a real sense that that, that is what is going on. Um, and often we talk about transparency as just something that, that comes from social media companies. Um, but in many cases, it's also something that has to come from governments as well. So to stay in the realm of uh, content moderation, more transparency, for example, over what types of um, content governments are ordering to be taken down is something that can certainly potentially increase trust in a digital environment because those who are using it can understand um, why is it that certain things might be being uh, taken down or not. So we can see that trust, of course, is multifaceted, that there are multiple stakeholders. But I think that one of the, the crucial things that, that we often forget is the, the role of multiple different types of civil society actors who will gain trust by having a feeling that they have, in fact, had a stake in writing the rules um, and discussing them as they are continually enforced. Thanks so much. Great, thanks a lot, Heidi. You know, I'm jotting down key words that I think are coming up as, as the discussion goes on. And so collaboration is certainly one of them. Multi-stakeholder is another. Transparency is definitely another one. And then maybe to use multi again, these, multi the, these multifaceted issues that are at play here. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's now turn to Nicole Turner-Lee from Brookings. Nicole, please. Thank you, Bob, and hello, everybody. So when you talk about this concept of how we define digital trust, I'm going to play off of what my colleagues have also mentioned and just add in some additional things that I think we should be considering. The obviously, digital trust assumes some type of reciprocity between the people who are collecting the information and the subject of that information. And in addition to privacy and resilience and transparency and, Bob, all the other uh, areas that you just rattled off, it's important that we also put as an undergird of digital trust fairness and inclusiveness, as well as frameworks that allow for us to have some flexibility, particularly when we're trying to apply any type of business product or service in the online economy to different and diverse populations. So in particular, when I think about the elements of digital trust, and in my work at Brookings, I work on issues related to closing the global digital divide in addition to balancing and addressing uh, algorithmic bias. What I think about is how do we develop a digital trust environment that reduces the likelihood of the consequences of systemic inequality? What does it mean for a product or service to be done and designed in a way and implemented and executed that it is done so fairly with minimized trade-offs to populations that have already experienced a variety of vulnerabilities when it comes to income inequality, educational employment, as well as criminal justice equity? So with that, I would just share a couple of things to add to the, uh, the pot there, Bob. One is that we need to allow for inquiry. And I would actually suggest to this conversation of multi-stakeholders, I'm a sociologist in this space, that it's very important to have a range of stakeholders, as it was already mentioned, from civil society actors, but civil society actors and groups that are representative of the lived experiences of the products that we're actually trying to design. We know, for example, in the United States and across the world that many of the developers of technological tools in this digital transformative period are not representative of the general population. So it's important for us to have the inquiry to first understand whether or not this is a product that we want to apply because it has less risk of consequence, but two, that it's representative of the voices, opinions, values, norms, and assumptions that come with the context in which that product is deployed. I think it's also important for it to be inclusive. Who is sitting at the table when we design and execute these models? How do we understand that digital trust means something different to different populations based on where they are in the world and where they may be within the context of that product and service? Are these uh, products and services in the midst of developing trust compliant and lawful? Do they have civil and human rights implications that are followed? Do they know those guidelines in the first place? And do they ensure that they're not making trade-offs between one's civil and human rights just for the sake of getting to the marketplace? I call that the shift from permissionless innovation to permissionless forgiveness, where we're telling groups sorry after we have broken it and try to fix it later. 
And then I would just say, as we close out on this conversation of digital trust, I always say to folks, we cannot forget at the midst of this are people. And as we think about ways in which we wrap our hands around the way the technology is literally transforming the lives of people, the extent to which we can apply digital trust more rapidly to reduce reputational risk of the companies who are putting out these products, but to also reduce harm, I think it's important that we really think about the people who are at the center of this debate when we actually see more of these products deployed into the marketplace. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. And I think you know you raised a really important point that multi-stakeholders doesn't necessarily is not necessarily representative and it, it needs to be representative. And as you say, fairness, inclusiveness um, are really, really important elements too. And you did bring up human rights, another important element. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna turn to uh, Stefan Verhust and then uh, Andy, Andy Wyckoff after him. Okay, Stefan, please. Great, thanks so much, uh, Bob, for the question and a pleasure to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. And again, it's very hard to follow in the footsteps of so many bright uh, scholars and uh, uh, policy makers that have come uh, before here. But just to answer the question, how do you define digital trust? I would take a step back and really reflect on what's the real asset that the digital transformation has generated. And from my point of view, it's really about data. And I think what we didn't anticipate perhaps at the beginning, but now have clearly a better understanding is that digital transformation has really led to datafication and that that is really where we need to probably focus our attention on. Now, when we think about datafication, obviously we've had that in the past, but I think the real distinguishing feature in the current environment is that we actually can reuse data that was used for one purpose and use it for another purpose. And that that on the one hand is the real scary opportunity, but also the real value proposition of the current digital transformation is that we have more data, but that that data can also start to be reused for other purposes in the hope to make society better, in the hope to indeed improve people's lives. So when I go to the definition of digital trust, then from my point of view, within that kind of context, it's really about confidence that data will be reused in a way that benefits society and that also improve people's lives, including the lives of those that have ultimately disclosed the data in the first place. Now that will require what I call a new social license to really leverage data for other purposes that was initially intended. And in order to establish that social license, we really need to have a more sophisticated debate with the public at large and with key stakeholders, including key interest groups that were also referenced uh, beforehand on how do we design the reuse of data for other purposes than initially intended. And it's not as simple as are you for or against reuse? It really is about how are we designing systems in ways that indeed instill confidence. And from my point of view, that requires us reflecting on at a minimum six elements that uh, we need to be aware of and that we have to have public engagement on designing it. The first element, and these are very simplistic kind of perhaps questions, but they can, of course, re anyway, make reference to far more complicated answers and far more complicated systems that we have to become more sophisticated about. But the first uh, question, of course, in order to get that social license that we need to answer is, why do you need the data in the first place? We need to become far more sophisticated about identifying purposes that can uh, add to societal benefits, but also be more transparent about the purpose of reusing data in the first place. The second question is then related to the what. What data are we actually talking about? And I think there is clearly a distinction between personally identifiable data and non-personal identifiable data. But when we start reusing and aggregating that, then suddenly that actually might all become PII. And so really having a better understanding on what is the data that we need for the purpose that was expressed, that's gonna be an important design principle in order to get that social license. The third element is then who, who has access to the data and who makes the, the decisions. And again, this was already mentioned uh, before, it's very important to be multi-stakeholder, but also from my point of view, we need to establish more professional accountability as well. Those that have access to the data 
need to be made more accountable in order to ensure a certain level of data stewardship that really would instill trust in how data is being used. How is the next question? How is it going to be accessed? And there are multiple uh, variabilities here in how data can be accessed, where it is being stored, and how it is going to be used. And so that requires a better understanding on more trusted reuse uh, mechanisms that can actually provide for that level of confidence. When that uh, refers to uh, when is it going to be used, but also when is it going to be deleted? And so we need to have an understanding on data retention because it's not because data that has been collected that it should be stayed and, and uh, processed and uh, saved forever. And I think trying to understand when is it actually uh, that we need to uh, disclose or uh, um, delete certain kinds of data in order to instill that trust. And then where goes uh, to the last question from my point of view that we need to uh, explain in order to instill trust is to also where is the data a stored, but also what's the jurisdiction in which the data is going to be accessed? Because clearly having reuse of data differs depending on the jurisdiction in which you are based and also perhaps the remedies and the redress that might be available if things go wrong. And so if we can have a more public debate about those six questions that are design modalities on how data is being reused, I think we will instill more trust and subsequently have a better environment of digital trust as well. Great. Thank you very much, Stefan. And, um, you know, the notion of social license, I think, is really important. And I think that actually goes back to um, what Nicole was saying, too. And I, I also think, you know, you raised the more fundamental point, and that is that this data driven economy, this world that we live in, you know, it really does require new gover governance frameworks. And we can certainly learn from the past, as Heidi has said, um, to on what on a way forward. Um, but and you've given us six, six areas to think about. Um, OK, so now let's turn to Andy Wyckoff. Great. Good to see you, Andy. I'm glad we fixed the, techni the technical issues. And uh, um, um, let's hear what you think are the essential, essential elements of digital trust. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And it's good to see everyone. And I'm afraid the OECD firewall doesn't trust you as much as it should. And this was part of my difficulty. But um, we've been grappling with this issue at the OECD really since we started work on this in 1980 on privacy guidelines and on cross-border data flows way back in 85 and, and, and so forth. So it, it's a prolonged ongoing issue. And I think every time we make a couple steps forward, and we have, I think, you've seen it with e-commerce at least, it's taken off, people trust it much more. There are brands they can associate with, they use peer recommendations, some of these kind of human connections that we need as trust markers. But every time we take those two steps forward, we go one back. And Stefan was just talking about this. Uh, we see more sophisticated uh, attempts at, at hacking data, both uh, illegal uh, trust demolishing tactics, but, but also quasi-legal things uh, such as dark patterns being used to, I think, dupe and uh, misconceive uh, consumers and, and users, and, the, and this erodes trust. And so for, for me, just to answer your question, the essential elements of trust are First, being treated like a human being, uh, and that means human rights, uh, systems of redress, and, and being a citizen, it means paying your taxes, uh, which is a big issue the OECD is trying to um, resolve. It's about transparency and explainability. I think some of the other speakers have talked about this. This requires, in my mind, responsible uh, disclosure of meaningful information that's appropriate to the context and consistent with the current state of the art. It's about robustness, security, and safety. People don't want to be on dodgy uh, platforms. They don't want to be put at unreasonable risk. Um, and this means that you have to have traceability of what's going on, particularly in advanced systems like AI uh, that allow it an analysis of the outcomes and uh, an adequate response in the redress mechanism. And, Last but not least, it's about accountability and accountable for the proper functioning of a product or a system. And 
And this won't surprise you, uh, those elements are in uh, the OECD AI principles, um, which I think are not a bad short com compilation of what I think uh, makes up trust. These were adopted by our membership as well as seven other countries in 2019, bringing to about almost 50 countries that are now adhering to them. But uh, I know what you're gonna ask. These principles just aren't enough though. Okay, they're, they're nice words. The question is for establishing trust, you need to take the next step. And for me, that's about implementing principles, turning them from policies into practices, uh, coming forward with products and processes that make them come alive, um, and then establishing some type of, as your other speakers have mentioned today, uh, audit procedures, and eventually maybe even enforcement of, of this. And again, uh, your speakers in this panel have talked about this. At the OECD, we always start with uh, data. We want to be able to benchmark how different countries are doing uh, in implementing these, these, these principles and then share both good practices and maybe things that haven't worked. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the beauty, I think, of an intergovernmental organization is getting those countries around the table to exchange that, that information and hopefully then creating a whole set of things around these principles that can, uh, and maybe even being backed up by regulations. And as you've talked today, the EU has put forward a proposal that I think uh, starts a debate, which will be uh, a very constructive one. Um, let me just end by saying, I think regulations are better suited for more mature uh, products and technologies that are closer to the market and being of use. But as you and I have talked about before, I also think to, we, we, we need to change some of our governance uh, mechanisms, uh, particularly around technology. And that may be may mean getting more upstream um, so that you can get more involved in the innovation process and shape those innovations so they have um, a trusted, uh, baked in, uh, by design uh, effort, uh, but one that doesn't unduly restrict innovation because at the end of the day, we've seen a lot of great innovations in this area and with it has come a lot of growth and productivity, which are things we want to preserve. Let me just end by suggesting that everyone read, uh, I almost fell off my chair, the G7 uh, Carbis Bay uh, communique, where it's it's a long one, it's 25 pages, I think, but, but two and a half pages were dedicated exactly to the topic we're talking about uh, today. And for, for me, that's that's a remarkable change to see leaders uh, begin to recognize the importance of uh, what you're talking about. Thanks, Bob. Great, thank you, Andy. Um, you know, you raised uh, this this notion of the corporate citizen, which I think is really important. And um, you know, it's, it goes well beyond, of course, paying their fair share of taxes. It's really the behaviors that we expect of our platforms and the role of self-regulation versus other types of regulation. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to our second round of questions, and um, I, I think. You know, we're almost, there's been some uh, overlap between the first set and the second set. So it should go hopefully quite naturally. And that is, what is your opinion on the way forward to build global digital trust? So we'll go in the same order and I'll start with uh, Maria Chiara, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much. According to this discussion and uh, uh, keeping my research approach, uh, I think that uh, what we want to, what, what we have to do in order to make some progress on that is to launch some uh, uh, concrete research activities uh, on these issues. For example, uh, we we want to, uh, we would like to launch some uh, international uh, uh, conference or international. Um, kind of forum on uh, how we can uh, analyze the different sectors uh, dividing private and public sectors. For example, uh, we discussed about uh, financial uh, market and uh, um, financial investment on, uh, in, uh, on digital uh, tools and uh, this is related to public, uh, to private uh, areas uh, where we have also access to services, to entertainment or similar uh, through digital uh, 
platforms and i think that in future we have to promote the, uh, to promote the development of platform for public administration like in education training or uh, healthcare uh, services so i think we have to make some uh, to develop some research on that to make some uh, trials uh, and uh, clinical trials for example in medicine because if we want to develop this digital trust we need also some uh, uh, evidence based uh, uh, approach which must be based on the use and on the effect and uh, on the monitoring of the effect of, of the of the use of digital uh, tools for accessing to uh, public services so uh, and uh, especially in medicine where we now uh, in the pandemia in covid-19 approach we are using a lot of uh, telemedicine telerehabilitation or uh, providing uh, healthcare services at home to 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 uh, to the public to citizens and we have to uh, make some uh, experimental and clinical trials and some uh, international or at least independent authority to monitor uh, this and uh, also we need some education program programs uh, in order to uh, make people understand uh, the uh, impact of digital uh, tools and uh, for improving digital trust uh, we need to be educated to that and uh, finally i think we need more uh, activities on uh, legal aspects and on philosophy because i think trust is something is a philosophical concept it's not an engineering uh, concept and we have to uh, to give some uh, new uh, meanings and new um, I don't know how to say new research and new uh, speculation on that to understand uh, uh, what is trust today. Trust uh, was uh, based on uh, personal relations, and now we have these personal relations are ma mediated by the digital uh, tool, and we don't understand exactly how to uh, the, the impact on that on uh, human relationships, on uh, on uh, on contracts, on on different uh, aspects, and uh, so I think that uh, in order to make uh, some uh, progress, we have to. Uh, analyze, divide and make some uh, strategies according to the different uh, areas where uh, digital uh, trust is expanding and is having an, imp an impact. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you very much, Ma Maria Chiara. And um, some of our T20 policy briefs, I think, are, uh, are going to shed some light in some of the areas that, uh, that you had mentioned. Um, OK, so now let's turn to Erica, please. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I guess sort of building on what I outlined previously about some of the um, the way that trust is important in the context of cyber resilience and the global financial sector, I think that there are a number of different areas and measures that both governments and industry could take to help um, improve trust and build a more sustainable uh, uh, trust-based uh, system. And I, I think that, you know, it may sound uh, counterintuitive, but I think that the process of working together and iterating uh, working together is important in helping to build trust, even though there are substantial sort of initial barriers uh, that make collaboration difficult. Um, I think the ideal end state is getting at this sort of operational collaboration model that I talked about before, where um, you know information sharing is is a is a foundation for it, but it it, it includes um, and encompasses measures that go beyond information sharing, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But um, I, just get, getting at the idea of sort of um, practicing working together to build trust. I think within the United States, at least, there are some interesting examples of how pilot programs have been um, have been established to serve as sort of proofs of concepts to help foster trust between different stakeholders, both within the government and in the private sector over time. So um, a great example of this is a few years ago, um, there was a pilot project that was stood up um, called Project Indigo within um, US Cyber Command, where um, a Cyber Command in collaboration with other interagency partners, including DHS and Treasury, um, FBI, um, and others uh, worked with um, uh, elements of the financial sector to uh, do a pilot essentially to see whether it might be possible to share um, threat information and to um, collaborate more deeply together 
um, to sort of improve the resilience of um, sort of systemically important um, financial institutions and, and sort of broader uh, critical infrastructure. Um, and, and this uh, this pilot program uh, developed into these two Pathfinder efforts, uh, one oriented around financial services and the other around the energy sector. And I think that um, that type of model, um, you know, where, where you start off with sort of a more ad hoc pilot task force type of approach within a particular country could be useful in helping overcome some of those uh, some of those trust barriers. Um, I, I think they're also, uh, you know, in the United States and also in, in the UK, there, there are sort of models of operational collaboration, I think, that, that stand out where, um, in particular, where industry has sort of self-organized as a way of working together and also working with, with the government um, to improve collaboration around these issues. Um, in the US, there is the, the ARC, which is formerly the FX ARC, which sort of functions as a mechanism for um, firms originally in the financial sector and now financial services and the energy sector to collaborate with the US government, especially in sort of a national security context when it comes to cyber threats. Um, and then sort of relatedly, um, in the UK, the uh, financial sector cyber collaboration center was set up I think, in 2018 and sort of ha has a similar type of model. I guess my point is that an important step in cultivating digital trust is Sort of piloting and building these uh, these organizations to uh, to sort of uh, to build that trust through the process of working together, and so I think um, it would be useful for for other countries to sort of explore how these types of models might be extended um, and applied and tailored to those unique uh, unique circumstances. Um, and and uh, last quick point um, to, to address the, the issue of um, trust in the integrity of data in particular. Um, which I think is um, particularly important and also um, salient now uh, with uh, with all the discussions around ransomware. There are initiatives um, like Sheltered Harbor, which are sort of these data vaulting initiatives that um, help better protect against uh, attacks uh, that target uh, data integrity. And so I think that um, promoting these types of initiatives is important, but it's also important to sort of test those uh, recovery processes before a crisis happens. Um, so those are just a few ideas on how to move forward in, in terms of thinking about improving trust and really it gets at um, sort of uh, trying to work together in small in small ways and uh, cultivating trust over time to enable more meaningful operational collaboration. Great, so great. Thanks a lot, Heidi. Um, so I'm realizing that we're getting short on time we have four speakers left, so I think uh, I initially allocated three minutes each, but I think we're going to have to go down to two, please. So, uh, Heidi, uh, with that challenge, I'll uh, pass the floor to you, please. Yeah, so I'll just say uh, two quick things. One is um, Maria Chiara raised the question of, of research and something that I've been involved in over the last year is, is setting up a, a global platform governance research network where we had our first conference virtually in March with um, 15 institutions from all around the world because indeed this research should be not only interdisciplinary but also global and I think that also means expanding our definition of research as Nicole mentioned to bring in lived experience as well as learned experience. So I'll just put that on the table that the one way we get to this is through thinking about this through a lens like platform governance that brings in uh, scholars from multiple different disciplines from all around the world. Um, and the second aspect of this I think that's that's crucial is um, broadening our sense of, of who we learn from and how and our adaptability. So I wrote a, a study last year that was looking at the first six months of, of COVID communications in nine democracies around the world um, and put forward a whole bunch of lessons, including from places like Senegal, Taiwan, South Korea and New Zealand. So I think making sure that we expand who we want to learn from is really crucial. And the final thing that I would say is one of the things I learned from that study was also the importance of adaptability and of deciding when not to use data. Um, and Stefan can perhaps talk more about that, but this was crucial, I think, in, in building trust was that sometimes that was about people knowing that their data wouldn't be used in certain ways or that their identity wouldn't be revealed. So for example, in South Korea, there was an outbreak in um, a nightclub that, that was mainly a, a gay nightclub and people did not want to go and get tested because testing was at that point not anonymous and they feared they would out themselves. So in response, um, the South Korean government made testing anonymous. So we see ways in which um, adaptability is really crucial and in that case, you built trust through having uh, more anonymous data and not using certain types of data, which I think is a, another thing that we can bear in mind. 
Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Heidi. So let's now turn to Nicole, please. And I'll, I'll also try to keep your time limited. So I've limited my points of five, from six to five. <laughs> um, I think that there needs to be some global consensus on how we even define digital trust. And I think that's an important conversation to have. So I congratulate you, Bob, on having this conversation, because I think that there is some ambiguity in terms of what digital trust really is and the associated problems. And I think as we develop what that definition is, it's really important for us to also future-proof it, because I think the type of application of digital trust to existing static technological products is different than the application of digital trust to more dynamic and emerging and burgeoning products. I think privacy needs to be at the heart of the conversations. And I think if the US wants to equally get on board with our friends in the EU, we need a federal privacy standard ourselves. And so I think coming to the table to talk about what privacy looks like in this age of digital economy is really important. I think sectoral guidance is needed as well, particularly in areas where we know the data is portable enough and can have the intrigue of weaponization. And so it's important for us, if you go back to what I said earlier about fairness, inclusivity, legal lawfulness, to ensure that we're also looking and getting sectoral guidance, particularly as we look at the global context in which uh, these products are deployed. Inclusion, I think, is quite important in terms of making sure not only that we have diverse voices at the table, interdisciplinary demographic, but we also think about the inclusion of sociologists, social scientists alongside technologists to understand as we're developing these products and we're thinking globally around its transformation transformational power that we're creating feedback loops also to the consumer and civil society groups. And then I would just go back to what Stefan said that we have to really go back and talk about data and how data has been both monetized as well as, you know, weaponized in cases where this conversation that we're having today lends itself to the type of cybersecurity vulnerabilities that we're seeing. We're going to solve this globally. There's got to be some cooperation and collaboration between partners, but there has to be some redefining and some consensus on what we mean by the terms that we're throwing out, or we're going to find ourselves coming back to the table and having this conversation again. Great. Thanks, Nicole. That, that was a, a great list. Um, okay, so now we're to Stefan, please. Great, and uh, no pressure to uh, um, to to cover my 10-step approach to a better world. So I'm going to limit it as well as Nicole has done to five. And the first uh, uh, area I would uh, advocate for is that we really, in addition to multi-stakeholder approaches, we actually also need a new kind of public deliberation about how do we acquire digital trust and spe specifically trust in how data is being used and reused. And so here I would advocate for every country that is uh, serious about developing a data strategy or a data governance approach, every region or even every city, to actually think about how do we create citizens' assemblies mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis to really have that kind of sophisticated deliberation around uh, the use of trust that can give uh, exactly that kind of social license as I've been talking about. Now, that will require also a certain sense of literacy, and so we also need to invest in order not only uh, for professional re reasons, but also for actually having a more sophisticated public debate, we need to invest in data literacy as well. So that was my first step. The second step is that quite often this whole discussion about data and digital trust is, is uh, perceived as, anyway, from a negative lens. What do we want to prevent, right? And I think we also need to turn it a little bit around and say, what is it that we actually would like to see more of and I think that will require a real investment in understanding what are the certain kinds of use cases or purposes that as a society, we would actually like to see more investment so that we are really leveraging data as an asset for good. And I think having a consensus, a global consensus and a national and even a local consensus on what are the kinds of purposes you would like to see data being used more for, that would be important to instigate some trust as well. Thirdly, we need a new profession, which I've been advocating for for a while. We need chief data stewards that really understand the value of data, the challenges of data, and can engage with the broader world around how do we actually establish trusted access to data for purposes that are beneficial to society. Fourthly, and that goes back to what Maria was saying, we need more research. Uh, I quite often make the bad joke is that the least sector that I've been encountering that uh, is uh, not data driven is the data sector. Uh, we need actually more data about the use of data and what works, what does not work. And so we need data driven data policies as opposed to quite often 
ideological ones, and that will require more research. And then lastly, we need massive more experimentation in data collaboratives and data collaboration or other forms of public-private partnerships around where you provide trusted access and trusted use of data that can benefit society. So with that, over to you, Bob. Well, thank you very much. I mean, we're getting some very concrete uh, suggestions on the way forward, which is uh, fantastic. So Andy, uh, it's your turn, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, just just to say, I, I I think what you've heard is a great list and I, I, I will echo a couple of them then take a slightly different direction. Just, yeah, OECD in particular, we're all about research and we really welcome the academic community pointing the way going forward. Some of that comes with trying to get data on data, as Stefan was just saying, which isn't easy. Um, but I, I think it needs to be done given its importance in the economy and society. It's about building new institutions and occupations, as Stefan said, but you know, it's about some interesting new experimentation going on out there to try to engender trust through third parties uh, and trusted third, third parties. But let me just end, Bob, with and try to keep you on time. Uh, your question was the way forward to build global digital trust. And um, I think um, that's a great long-term goal, one which we should all aspire to, but I think we need to take some baby steps. And so it's about starting maybe in your own backyard or within the EU or within the Nordic uh, countries, um, or even maybe uh, G7 or the G20, and then snowballing it, uh, building on that, learning from it, trying to refine it, and then taking it more on a global basis. I, I think that stepwise basis is really the only practical way forward. Thanks. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, you've managed to keep us on time. And in fact, you've given me a minute just to say something uh, on, on behalf of some of the work we're doing at CG. Um, because in fact, I, I mean, what we've heard in this, and we've heard multi-stakeholder collaboration we, you know, digital technologies are, are pervasive across all walks of life, all countries. And, um, and so the work we're doing at CG is all about creating a global governance framework and which we think is essential um, to, for, all, for all countries and all people to benefit from the digital technologies. And so we, we have promoted this concept of a, of a digital stability board, which is modeled after the financial stability board. And it really is just a mechanism to get that global cooperation um, so that we get consistency uh, across jurisdictions so that everyone has a seat at the table uh, uh, on discussions around governance. Um, okay, well, listen, I, I want to thank everyone very, very much for the time they've taken. Some, of, some people have, uh, have been participating in events earlier this morning as well. I just want to say a big thanks to everybody. Um, you've given us a lot of information that uh, that I think is invaluable uh, and and can will feed into the T20 discussions. Um, so as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, there will be a recording of this event available on our CG website uh, soon. Um, I'd encourage you to also subscribe to CG online. And um, and then next week, uh, there will be the T20 Global Policy Forum, People, Planet, and Prosperity, the themes of the G20. And this will take place on June 22nd and 23rd. And uh, it's open to the public. I'd invite you to, uh, to go to info.t20italy.org uh, to register. Uh, Maria Chiara and I will both be speaking at this event among many other very, very, very good speakers. So thank you very, very much and have a, a great day or a great evening uh, or I guess uh, end of morning to some of you. Okay, thank you.